My name is Ashok Vaswani. I'm currently the Chief Executive Officer for Barclays in the UK. I've been in financial services for a long period of time. Uh, started off in Bombay, then Dubai, Istanbul, Brussels, New York, Singapore, which was my favorite, uh, New York back, and now in London. I have to say I'm more excited about what I do today than I've ever, ever been in the last 30 years. It's such an exciting time to be in financial services. So we'll try and get that out of you later. Sure. Uh, my name is Jonathan Trans, uh, chairman of ACB. I've been chairman for six years, so it's relatively new compared to these uh, amazing guys on, on stage here. Um, so I come from Asia Commercial Bank, which is a, a retail leading bank in Vietnam. So we have 367 branches across the country, uh, really focused on retail, and that's our core strength. And we're very excited to be here um, talking with all you guys. Thank you. I'm Werner Steinmüller, CEO of Asia Pack for Deutsche Bank. And before, I was 12 years running for global transaction banking. This is really tech-based. And additionally, I was the chairman of Deutsche, bon uh, Deutsche Post Bank, a real retail bank. And before, I also worked some time in corporate finance. 40 years banking experience. Right. So now you know who the panelists are, or my victims. Um, we're going to start a game with a game, uh, just to get the energy levels up. It's a game called Overrated, Underrated. And basically the gist of this is I will fire off a question or actually a phrase or a word and the panelists have to decide whether it's underrated or overrated. So let's start with you, Ashok. Innovation in banking. Overrated. Overrated. Okay. Overrated. Overrated. So innovation in banking is overrated. Okay. Werner? Underrated. Okay. Um, a bank's ability to innovate? Underrated. Underrated. Mm. Werner? I have to think about it. Uh, overrated. <laughs> overrated. All right. So I, I am going to remember all these answers. Uh, valuable fintech to bank collaboration. So valuable fintech to bank collaboration. So value enhancing. So partnerships between banks. Underrated. 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 I think you're going to have to keep, keep the mic close to, to your mouth when you speak. Um, cryptocurrencies. Overrated. Underrated. <laughs> Underrated. OK. Overrated. Overrated. So why do you say that? Well, the underlying technology is quite good. Uh, the current applications uh, is still up for debate. OK. And why are you saying underrated? I think the opportunity that that provides is just simply huge. The amount of power that can go on the chip and the amount of stuff you can do with that, uh, I think it's only, the limits are only set in the mind. OK. And is that a view held across the businesses? Or is that something where your own personal thoughts around cryptocurrencies? I would say that's more of a personal view. Uh, and I think that is going to kind of evolve. I don't, this is just the opening chapter. Sure, okay, of a trilogy. Okay, open banking. Underrated or overrated? Underrated. 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 Okay, well, I'm not gonna ask you why. Uh, platform businesses in banking. Underrated. 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 All right. It's Banks boring. and software houses. Overrated. I'm, I'm in between, probably You're more sitting on the fence. Yeah. Can, can you repeat the question? So, banks as software houses. Underrated. Okay. So, I've got a few more and then we'll, we'll come back to these. Um, so, banks setting up new digital bank subsidiaries. So, there seems to be a bit of a wave going on at the moment, certainly in the UK. Overrated. 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 Well, Underrated. Okay. Why overrated? Because in my senses, look, at the end of the day, uh, investing in one brand and keeping one brand relevant, healthy, uh, energetic is hard work in itself. Trying to do it with two brands and trying to distance yourself just by changing the name, you're not going to suddenly change what you're really about, right? But what if it's a separate subsidiary? Even if it's a separate subsidiary, it's still powered by the main, uh, by the main company, right? Okay. So just setting it up as a separate brand, I don't think does anything. Just 
different I agree with Ashok. It is really very important. We start separated. What I see now much more integrated in the main business. Because having a subsidiary is not solving it. The whole bank has to change. Okay. Okay. And any comments on that, Jonathan? I think it's, it's actually, if you take a look at from the investor perspective, Bill, um, it's always expected you have to have reporting the next quarter's of profit, right? So this is something new. You need to separate it out so that it have the life of its own. It doesn't have so much pressure to just chunk out revenue right away and just have the longer term ROI um, entirely to it. Okay. Okay. That's fair. So uh, one more. Innovation Labs. Overrated. Overrated. Underrated. Underrated. Okay. Come on. Because actually it's about taking what happens in an innovation lab, bringing it back into the business and actually making it happen. I've not seen too many examples where something has really come out of an innovation lab and then really made big time scale in the main bank. Possibly ING. Go Is further. ING direct. Okay. Uh, Werner, why? I see the innovation lab to keep is your... scouting yeah. for solutions. They shouldn't execute, they should scouting. And a good f football team has good scouts. <laughs> okay. Okay. Well, I think some people like that question. Come on. Right. Okay. We'll come back to that. Um, so, so the focus of this session is, is essentially a debate around innovative transformation versus future revenues. And I suppose um, before we can come on to that, you know, what is innovative transformation for you guys? And maybe, Ashok, if you could start with what, what is innovative transformation? Because that can mean so many things to different people, but, you know, we all talk about it, but is it really innovative? So, uh, Pat, at least the way I think about it is that uh, over the last, call it 10, 15 years, there's been a significant amount of change, right? Earlier on, it was all about products and how you become best in class in a given product. And if you became best in class in a given product, you hopefully get the customer to choose that particular product, uh, you know, and that's how you kind of got, there was a whole notion of cross-sell and the ability to capture the customer's wallet and all of that. What has now happened and what the new technology now allows us to do is to really get behind the customer experience. And the customer experience and owning the customer being the layer that the customer interfaces with is the most important thing. And therefore, the innovation has to happen in the experience. And anything that actually transforms that experience is what is innovative, it will drive further revenues and allow you to continue to price. If you're just left on a product basis, you will be pushed into the plumbing and see significant margin erosion. But then how do you structure for that internally? Because it's a bit of a sea change from say the last say five, 10 years, certainly um, and, and before that. It is a very, very significant change. And I think, and I think companies have not fully grasped. Uh, it's a very cliched thing to say that we are going product centricity to customer centricity, but pure customer centricity is a very hard thing to achieve. And I think shifting the balance of the organization where uh, the power used to be in the product managers to shifting that to making the power in the segment managers and choosing which segments you really want to go after uh, is, is, I think, a big fundamental move that all of us have to make. Sure. I suppose, um, Jonathan, in our conversation earlier on today and, and last week, um, your challenges are very different than, say, Werner's and, and Ashok's. And, you know, you have a marketplace where there's innovation occurring at a rapid rate. So what, what does innovative transformation mean to you in, in, your, in your context? Right. I think, let, let me share a real life example here. So, so in Vietnam, you can actually order a big screen TV and a dishwashing machine, have it both deliver and install in two hours. Um, even Amazon two cannot, hours? Two hours, yeah. Even Amazon cannot do that. And this is not from rocket science at, at all. This is actually a seamless integration of online and offline activities and infrastructure. Um, this is actually using a, a, not a smartphone, but an old tech phone and a motorbike. We have a 30 million motorbike. So leveraging that infrastructure with the technology um, is, is very powerful. So for us, um, innovative transformation is really trying to think of a way to leapfrog uh, the technology, not copying it from other market, from developed market. Um, and the current state of place, I think, is, is prime 
uh, time for, for, for innovation to springboard for the next transformation. Sure, sure. And so for, just to build on that, um, Werner, around, um, can you kind of outline a particular initiative? So what, what's one of the, the best initiatives, Werner, that you, that's going on in Deutsche Bank that you would classify as innovative, transformational? When you think about innovation, you have to think out of a box. And I shock you alluded to it, now we have a revolution. In the past, all of our solutions were mainframe based on the banking regulated payments. So what banks have to do is go out of a box. We launched last week, it called UNAR. UNAR is a pay pack, a royal, a royalty card program where you can put all your cards in the system and collecting all points. What does it have to do with banking is the question. It's pretty clear, and you lose money in the beginning, but in phase two, we want to add then payment schemes. And it's pretty clear, and when we discussed it in the board, it was not to make money, it's to show we get client data, information, which is much more important, and hopefully, going forward, and you spoke about the various phases in phase two, after two, three years, we may easily make some money. But this is not the first attention. First is attention getting client data because this is very important. And so the bank decided to spend millions in these new programs is for me innovation. And is there a time limit on when you have to achieve payback? It's very interestingly, they have quite some time. Some this time. is exceptional. Normally, when you sit in the board, immediately pay big period of a project. In this project, we decided on purpose differently. And if you are not trying it, and specifically, we are now 150 years old, you have to innovate. You have to compete. If you don't do it, you fail. OK, OK. So we'll, we'll come back to the time limit and maybe criteria and a little bit around payback because that, that's the nub of the conversation. And, and I suppose it would be good to, to hear from you, Ashok, around you know, a particular or you know, one of the most innovative transformation initiatives that you guys are working on. And, and if you could kind of dissect that a little bit and talk about you know, who is it, where does the val where's the value being created and you know, does it have to achieve a particular criteria by year one, year two? Is it kind of three to five years, five to 10 years? So Pat, like I said, I think, I think the innovation and the transformation is going to come in owning the customer experience. Because if the customer experience is great, you get a higher customer engagement, and if you get a higher customer engagement, you get more involvement of the customer with your basic products. So let me give you four, I'll give you two examples. Sure. So the first example is what we've recently launched, where uh, uh, as part of your mobile banking, for every single transaction, not only can you see uh, the logo uh, of that particular brand. So let's say you went and did a transaction at uh, Bloomingdale's or Debenham's, you actually see that particular brand logo. And not only do you see the brand logo, you actually see the map as to where you did that transaction. Now it's very, very common, for example, for people to have a different known brand name and a different merchant name, hmm. right? So in the UK, for example, Costa Coffee is a classic one. So Costa Coffee, is where everybody buys a lot of their coffee from. Mm -hmm. uh, second only maybe to Starbucks, or maybe even bigger than Starbucks. But the, brand, the merchant name is Whitbread. So when I see my statement, or I see my mobile app, and I suddenly see a transaction which says Whitbread, I say, I never went to Whitbread. But if I show it as Costa Coffee, it changes the kind of thing, right? And then it tells you where exactly that location you went. So this avoids, for example, customers calling and saying, oh, I didn't do this transaction because they couldn't recognize the merchant name, right? And so it is not only a great customer engagement tool, it avoids costs, it builds customer uh, kind of loyalty, engagement, and because it cut costs, it's, it's a good thing and pays back pretty much very, very, very quickly. Mm. The other one is, you know, when you start with a single kind of use case, so for example, we've got a uh, P2P payment app called Ping It. Now for P2P, we don't normally charge, so there are no charges. But Ping It has really, really taken off in the UK. And what we've been doing is saying that, look, if social media companies can get into payments, why can't payment companies get into social media? So for example, let's say the two of us go out for lunch. Let's say you buy me lunch. 
I want to pay you back. I can over lunch take a photograph and along paying you back also send you the photograph. So you'll say, okay, so what's the big deal in that? The big deal in that is the use cases that follow from that. So now think about insurance companies who instead of sending uh, premium notices can actually send a photograph of a premium notice. Just hit pay and you get the payment back. Or the insurance company, you know, usually below a certain threshold, they don't check. So let's say I've got home insurance, my TV breaks, I take a photograph of my TV, I send it to the insurance company, insurance company says, yeah, this is going to be less than 100 pounds, no processing, I pay immediately. The moment of truth for an insurance company is settlement of claim, right? So that is a, that is a good example of a transformative, owning the customer experience, changing the business model in delivering that and getting payback pretty quickly as well. So it's those moments of truth. And I was going to say, I think you still owe me for lunch last time anyway. Uh, Sorry? I think you still owe me for lunch. Um, OK, so experimentation. <laughs> experimentation. Um, you know, I think, Jonathan, it would be interesting to understand you know, experiments have revenue challenges. You know, that, that's quite clear. And you know, if you could maybe describe some of the experiments that you do within the bank and how are you trying to change change your organization to, to be you know, in sync with what's going on in the marketplace? I think experience is always important. And um, I think it's, the first thing is you really have to get your hand dirty. Um, for instance, um, for us, we have the Innovation Lab, which is, I think is an undergraduate, but it's just something that is to change the culture, to get people really uh, passionate about changing uh, the way we usually do business, really understand the customer pain point and try to solve it. Um, so, for, for for instance, we have let's say we have the we just launched a mobile CRM for our relationship manager. Um, so, where they can literally we have thousands of them, um, and then now I mentioned earlier with a 95 million population with 30, over 30 million mobile uh, uh, motorcycle. Um, so now imagine using that infrastructure and then enhancing our relationship manager with the tools where they can actually bring the bank to the customer living room. Uh, that's completely changed the way the customer experience with the bank. Um, and now we have another app that's called a cross sale that really uh, recommend, uh, make recommendation for, for, for the RMs to know what the, the, the customer has been using, recommend the next products or services that they might need. So now today, the, the customer, they literally don't have to go to a bank and the bank can actually go to their living room. And we, so that is the experience that we're using. The existing infrastructure it can seem to be a bit low tech, but adding some other factor into it and all of a sudden you, you have a marriage of one plus one greater than two. Sure, and, and how much resource can you dedicate to, to experimentation? Because if you look at say, so Ping An is a great example. Ping An has 15,000 developers. Um, it has a number of different subsidiaries, and they all seem to be kind of working on the latest technologies to see how it could be relevant to its core businesses, but, but then also be kind of maybe white labeled off to other, other providers. And how, how, you know, how much is, is available for, for true experimentation without having to see a return straight away? Well, I don't, I don't think there's a percentage number would justify it because then we'll have to choose between uh, innovation versus revenue, future revenue. But when you look at a different way, where you have a longer horizon, a longer ROI measurement, and a different way of generating revenues, it's a completely shifting way. So let's say for us, we, um, for innovations, we, it's a day-to-day -day business for us. As I have to do it, my senior, senior team have to do a CEO, not just a job of the CTO, um, for instance, uh, we, we have the innovation challenge, which we'll call ACB Wins. Uh, this is the second year we launch it. And actually, one of the top five team, uh, the member of the, the one of the top five are division head, finance, uh, uh, property appraisal, credit processes. And that's very interesting that they do that BAU normal, but you don't expect them to, to innovate, right? But then when you open the playground for them, it's, it's innovate everywhere. So it's, it's, it's spread like a Wi-Fi. So you can't really put a wall of say, okay, 80% on here, it's just you can do your business as usual, and the other 20% that's you have your hat on as innovation team and then do only innovation. So we encourage, we encourage that our employees to just break down all the barriers of the current processes to understand the customer pain point and try to uh, resolve it. So, in terms of budget, IT is right now the third largest um, 
have have the third largest budget for for the bank. So sure. probably you know about twenty or thirty million. Okay, fantastic. I suppose um, Werner, you you mentioned Innovation Labs were underrated, and so I know you guys have rolled out a few labs recently, and certainly obviously there's one in Singapore. And you know how much resource do you, do you generally put into um, into true experimentation? Um, and, and, and what is the dynamic there? What, what, you know? As I mentioned before, for labs which we have in Silicon Valley, London, Berlin, and hopefully very soon also here in Singapore, the job is coming up with ideas for solutions. And then for our retail side, we have a production facility of 1,000 people, and this is outside of a bank, outside of banking hierarchies. You don't have titles. You have project manager for mobile payments, product managers for example, paying with a credit card through your mobile phone. And this is where we're organizing the teams and the teams are also, when the project is finished, new allocated. For this new development, the, fin uh, the FinTech labs bring for ideas and then they're included. In this office are working bankers, classical bankers, as well as people who are coming from outside. What we also do, number one, we are using ideas from fintechs a lot because people are creative and also when you give a classical banker to make a website, it looks ugly. If you have someone with ideas, it looks much more modern and user-friendly. And one thing is user-friendly. A lot of these things is, has to be user-friendly. And as I mentioned, we have around about 1,000 people working there in all kinds of things. And what is also, we tell them, it's not bad you fail. I grew up in an organization you only could become credit manager when you had basically, and I'm shocked you're coming from the same organization, when you had a bad case, you made some losses. And this is, you have to learn from him. The second time you don't make this mistake, and an organization has to prepare and new things. We are also developing classical products on our own. Uh, mm -hmm. And, or we buy, we bought uh, Mudo, this is, um, uh, for, for changing wallets between uh, a different organization or API company in India, we're participating, not totally integrating. If we are totally by 100% they're managed by us, it's bad because you are losing the culture. And the classical bank culture has too much control and, and, and we need this innovative experience. It's a mixture of all this idea, trial and error, and we are discussing it, learn from the mistakes, and maybe you have to mind five, six mistakes and there's one great idea. And I think this is one of the key things. Try it, give them money, and don't blame the people who make mistakes. So I think we should pick up on that, actually, because um, there was a, a lot of topics earlier this year around uh, celebrating failure. And you know, it would be good to understand your biggest failures in terms of any initiatives that you've personally worked on, what's the biggest failure you've had, and what did you learn from it? I could go on for a long time. Uh, no, but I mean, uh, look, there are a couple of things uh, which we've tried to launch which have not worked. Uh, and uh, we've definitely learned from that. We've learned uh, all kinds of uh, lessons from, you know, what is, uh, what, what really is user testing, what is the real customer need, and how we're going about solving that customer need. We've learned not to make compromises in uh, customer experience. We may have launched something and, you know, we've not got scale up in that particular thing, so it remains like a hobby. Uh, so it's a classic product cycle kind of thing that you have to go through. Uh, and, Any uh, you want to name? Or sorry? Any you want to name? So, you know, I, I, I could do an internal name and we, we launched something like Cloudit, which allowed customers to store all their personal data uh, on the mobile phone, right, in, a, in an external cloud but under the protection of Barclays. Frankly, we didn't get take up uh, for that. Uh, pretty significant, we spent a lot of money, we didn't get take up uh, for that. Uh, we've launched a whole bunch of initiatives around uh, information and what we can do with information. It's been three years, we've not, got, we've not been able to monetize uh, that as well. So there have been instances where things have not worked. And uh, you know, but I think, I think the point that he makes is absolutely correct. Uh, there will be some things which will work and there'll be some things which will not work. We've got to take the learnings and move on. 
I mean, what do you say is the criteria that you use for some of these decision making? Because th there's a, a great example I'm going to bring up shortly with um, the French bank BPCE and Fidor Bank, which was recently announced. Um, but I'll come on to that shortly. But but what is your kind of your KPIs? You know, just so the audience here can can kind of get get an idea if they want to work with you guys. What, how do you evaluate some of these initiatives um, that aren't necessarily going to win money in year one? So two things. The first criteria is uh, two ways to think about it. First is definitely the criteria is not money in year one. If you can get customer adoption, customer scale, and customer engagement. Customer engagement is the most important thing. If you can get the customer engagement, Monetizing at the back end, I think, is not going to be a problem. So is that simply measuring Measuring engagement. How many customers engagement. are actually engaging with it? Right? Okay. That's the most important thing. Now, after all these learnings, what we've done is we've created a beta testing site. So we've got a mobile, uh, a mobile banking app. We've yep. got a beta site, which is called Launchpad, which has got really about 20,000 real customers. Mm -hmm. So now what we do is, for, for uh, fintechs who want to work with us, we also supply them the Barclays design, uh, design language. They can kind of use the Barclays design language, do up their app, launch the app on uh, Launchpad, and get real customer feedback. If the customer likes it, then the ability to switch it from Launchpad into our, more, uh, into our main mobile banking app is a very, very easy thing to do. If the customer does not like it, then at least you've got phenomenal feedback. So sure. either which way, it's a real win-win. And Launchpad has helped us, uh, you know, has helped us and helped a lot of our partners quite uh, incredibly. Sure. And if you were to say, um, if we looked at Horizon, so I was speaking to one of the guys from BBVA earlier on today, and, and they kind of mentioned that Horizon 1 roughly is one to three years, Horizon 2, three to five, and then five to 10. If you had to weight that percentage-wise, where would you say your initiatives currently are within those time horizons? So I wouldn't put a time frame uh, like you know one to two years and three to five years and seven years. Yeah. What the, at least the way I think about it is there's stuff that I need to do innovation in my existing business model, right? Uh, getting more efficient, becoming smarter as to how I'm doing stuff, instant fulfillment, all of that is you know immediate horizon one kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. Horizon 2 kind of stuff is extension of existing business model. And Horizon 3 is new business model. So we've just about, about a year ago established a separate uh, unit called uh, Barclays UK Ventures. Right? Barclays UK Ventures is not a venture capital fund. But Barclays UK Ventures is looking to identify what could be the new potential revenue models for a retail bank such that in five to seven years, can we see line of sight to about 700 to a billion pounds in revenue? So what are the areas that we would invest in, which we would think about today, that will generate that kind of revenue in five to seven years? So that's, I, I look at Horizon 1, Horizon 2, Horizon 3, as how much is an existing business model, extension of existing, existing business model, and new business models. Sure, okay. It'll be interesting to see how, Jonathan, how does that compare and contrast to to the way you, you see things for your, for your bank? Well, we have, uh, for, for us to pick uh, a criteria, we have three criteria. First of all is whether it's going to address, uh, fit the uh, unique needs for the local markets. So copying ca copycat uh, ideas from different markets and trying to apply to local markets probably doesn't work for us. Um, the second thing is that does it help us to leapfrog uh, technology uh, out of company? Uh, so leapfrogging is key for you guys. Yeah, so just, just, because then if you're constantly trying to catch up, you are already behind. Yeah. Um, then you, you keep trying to build and fixing the legacy system that you currently have, but why don't we just leapfrog? It was much faster. And then the third one is whether that technology or that in innovations will promote probability, whether it's from reducing costs, um, generating revenues, or increasing customer or enhancing customer satisfaction. And we measure the customer satisfaction based on that. Um, okay. And how many would you say initiatives that you're working on today are for five years plus? Well, we have, what we have is, let's say we'll, we have one side is ACB the bank, and then we have the other one is ACB the platform, right? So for all the initiative that we currently have, let's say we, we have the one initiative called the customer value propositions, which is building around exactly what our customer need. But underneath that, we have a lot of initiative building into 
the future, where we see in, say, 10 years' time, ACB now, the vision, ACB the bank, would be the leading retail bank, and then ACB, the platform, would be the integrated platform to serve the, uh, the financial needs of our customer. So from that, the journey changing from pr providing the banking products to providing the, the banking experience, and then at the next step, providing banking as a lifestyle. So the horizon, let's say the, the customer value proposition, um, which will take us maybe about 18 months to, to, to two years, and then building all the ecosystem platform will be about another five years. Over five years, wow. Because, so the, because then we need to actually go with the market. Um, you don't want to come out with the products that is already ahead, um, and then there's no user and you sure. put a lot of investment there. So it's also measuring how ready the local market is. Um, Coalition right now is quite encouraging. We have, uh, let's say, 85% of the, the city and the urban uh, populations actually using smartphone technology and they're very adaptive to the new technologies. Fantastic. And so, Werner, time horizons? It depends on the project. And I'll give you one example. GPI from Swift is a new payment mechanism using a cloud, saving a lot of fees for the clients, and you always know where your cross-border payment are. In the beginning, 30 banks put together, made the system. Now, 18 months later, it's fully accepted. We are 80 banks and will be over 1,000 banks pretty soon. So after a period of two years, immediately proved to be successful. Other projects even take longer give another example, blockchain. I think for four years now we are looking for blockchain opportunities and it is highly complex. I like the system, but I also have to understand there is tremendous limitations from the legal point of view, from the capacity of computers. It would be ideal to put the swift payment with 10,000 banks, one million transactions on a blockchain technology. Everyone knows all information. The computer capacity doesn't exist and, and put away the legal aspects. So you see, you have a technology maybe in five years, now we're working five years already on this project, maybe another five years are needed and then the capabilities are. So I'm against to put it in category one, two, and three, it depends on the project, and then you bring a project to do the board. Say it very openly. We will make certain losses, but these losses will help for the cluster, customer satisfaction, what all of you said before, Jonathan and Ashok. This is very important, but say it, and then you also have a good argumentation, and not coming after six months, first review, 12 months, next review, and, and then is that the project. But if you're open, speak about it, do it. So I'm against this categorization, one, two, three. Okay. okay. Totally agree. Any, any responses to that? At, at one level, I think, I think we're talking about, you know, we, I'm just kind of phrasing it in terms Definitely. of uh, the, the extension to the business model and new business models, mm -hmm. which is, I, I, I guess, pretty much uh, the same as his thought is. Uh, so not very different in my view yeah. from, from what he said. So you're the same. And you also. <laughs> well, I also. The, the, the market is changing. I'm trying so to get fast, a lively so, debate yeah. going here. Yeah. Come on. So, you know, Help it's, me out it's here. something you can have the horizon for 18 months, but then six months later, your competitors already have a breakthrough products or services that is already cool. there. So, 18 months is already two months, right? Yep. So, or even 12 months, if you even finish ahead of time, it's, or you're already behind. So. Okay. So, let's talk about uh, startups and banks working together. Um, and in particular, there was news recently, I don't know if you guys have picked up on it. Um, BPCE, one of the largest banks in France, um, and the recent acquisition, which was of two years ago, a company called Fedor Bank, which is pretty much one of the most innovative banks a few years back and possibly is still today. And it was an acquisition two years ago. Now they announced that they are parting ways and word on the street kind of suggests that they, you know, one of the challenges was that uh, Fedor Bank was never really integrated into this larger organization and there didn't seem to be any development plan. And um, so that, that kind of pretty much probably starved that startup of, of maybe going above and beyond where, where it was supposed to do in its original path. So, you know, there's very few examples of successful bank to startup collaboration. And, you know, if, if it's startups that are doing, you know, transformational kind of quite innovative 
uh, products and services. You know, what, what's your take on that? How how can banks work with startups and, and vice versa? And you know, you may have a great vision to say, right, this is what we're going to do, guys. But what about three, four layers down? Do they share that? Are they incentivized? Are they going to lose their jobs? What, what, what's the score there? So, so, so what I agree with is that it's not easy to execute. And I don't think that's not uh, the not easy to execute is something about uh, a vision or somebody uh, you know, losing a job three or four levels below. The point is, look, at the end of the day, the beauty of a startup is they've grown up in today's world. So they're cloud native and stuff like that. They can move much more quickly. They're much more nimble. But at the end of the day, if the startup is coming to, let's say, a big bank, like let's say Barclays, or for that matter, ACB, or for that matter, Deutsche, then mm -hmm. the biggest advantage is the customer base that all three of us represent. And therefore, integration and giving that product, giving that service to the customer bases that we represent is, is actually the biggest opportunity. So getting, getting fintechs to really work with the big banks, not easy. Now, you've got to recognize that and deal with that. We've recently, I think it was about four or five months ago, uh, did a partnership with a company called Market Invoice. The Market oh, yeah. Invoice in the UK, they are very, I mean, Anil, uh, who's the CEO, really smart guy, fabulous team, really fabulous team. They built a phenomenal product. Uh, and, you know, frankly, if we wanted to build the product, we would have built the product, but then there are 100 things we want to do. And therefore, just from a prioritization point of view, going and building out the product was not hitting the priority. So we partnered with Anil and his team, and we are working with Market Invoice. Now, but we are very, very clear there that we are not going to do a complete uh, integration of Market Invoice platform into our platform. What we will build is a referral kind of model where we are referring clients seamlessly onto their platform. And then we can do the funding and stuff at the back. So the expectations or the vision is not a complete integrated uh, solution, mm -hmm. but a referral kind of solution. And I think that kind of expectation, setting that expectation is very, very important. And how do you get the people to follow that as well? So you may have your view, but the people that are actually executing the relationship and the partnerships, how do you actually get them? So it's to usually they who will come and tell you that, yeah. look, full integration is not possible. It's usually the CEOs who are okay. looking to say full integration. So the, at this time, in fact, you give in to the teams who say, look, the right way to do it is to have this kind of partnership model as opposed to a full integration model. Okay. So if, I think we're going to, it's going to take a while to get to that, the nub of that. And I think we've got 12 minutes. And I'm just wondering if there's questions from the audience, please submit them. I'm not seeing anything come up on the tablet, but I kind of want to come to one of the key, kind of the key kind of questions that when I speak to a number of bank CEOs at the moment, you know, there's, there's the question of innovation. So can a bank innovate from within its, within its four walls? Does it need to partner to be able to innovate truly? Or does it need to build something brand new? And so it'd be good to kind of get the views from the audience here on this one. So who here thinks a bank can innovate from within its business? Raise your hands. OK. One person. Two people. Right, OK. So who thinks? There's a lady at the back. Oh, OK. <laughs> lady at the back. Um, so then the second one is, um, who thinks, and raise your hand for this, if banks need to partner to be able to truly innovate? Just a little bit more. OK, so I'm assuming the rest of you believe that banks need to build something completely new. Raise your hands. <laughs> who doesn't know? Who's fallen asleep? <laughs> right. Okay, so. Well, Look, I, I think uh, the extent of innovation that is required is so, I mean, it's like every single aspect of our business needs to be rethought. And therefore to say, I will do innovation only in one particular way, i.e. I'll only build or I'll only partner, uh, I, think, I think it's just not possible. I think you just got to take a whole series of, uh, you know, different things. There are certain things definitely which we will build. There are certain things where, like I suggested, we would partner, and so we are taking a mixed approach to this. So if you could only pick one, what would it be? Only one. Then I would build. Build. Okay. Jonathan. Well, I actually think 
I agree with, uh, disagree with Alan a little bit. That, 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 you know, <laughs> I, I think bank can definitely innovate from within. The question is, uh, the, not the question can bank innovate, but whether is, is that innovation is enough. So, yes, we can innovate, but the inside knowledge is probably enough. Nor the the outside knowledge is is enough. It's the integration of both, and you really need the key thing here is. is Innovation is, at the end of the day, what you innovate for. You can't just innovate for the sake of innovation or trying to have a solution, a solution trying to find a, a problem. Okay. Um, so it's, it's a culture. It's a culture that, that you... You know what to I'm going to ask you? If you had to pick one. All free. And I'll give you examples. That's not on the table. What? That's not on the table. You have instant payment, which is a classical payment which is now introduced in Europe with a payment service directive number two. Opportunity is unbelievable. It can even challenge for credit cards because you can say you don't need a credit card, you can pay immediately and you get the goods shipped. Think about it. This is a classical product which should be developed by bankers. Any of the more innovation side where the bank don't have it, buy it, cooperate from fintechs, include it in solutions, and I think this is part number two is most important, is collaboration with the fintechs to be successful. And fintechs is two for me. Number one, startups, but also the new giants. We have not spoke about the giants. The PayPal's, the Tencent, uh, the Alipay, who are really also need banking products. And also you can also partner with them because we work under payment service directive, we are under banking license, and there is connectivity between the two. Another opportunity. And number three, what we did on the royalty card program, you can say, why, what is the bank doing, as I mentioned before, Roy? 100% developed alone, independent from the bank, not even a banking license is needed, and don't touch it by a banker, because this would be the worst. So I see three areas, if I, what is the most important one is the number two, collaboration with fintechs, but not only for startups, also for mature fintechs. Okay, so you're going with number two, option number two. Yep. Okay, we got there in the end. <laughs> so we've got a question from the audience. Um, so what are the strategies to overcome challenges in innovation slash collaboration outside? Well, I think I can share a little bit, not, not, not would say a strategy, but lesson learned. Say for us, we, we have what we call the, the training center, which is uh, probably the most recognized training center in, in the country for, for banking, for bankers, um, well regards by regulator. But then we quickly learned that the training center, our core strengths, eventually will become our weaknesses because the, the landscape is changing so quickly. So what we changed last year, we just actually launched what we call the learning hub. So it's, it's a huge paradigm shift from we're going to train you from this is exactly all the process, all the, all, all the step that you need to do into the learning organization culture that, hey, this is something we'll learn together with you. We'll learn with our partner. We'll learn with, with the, the other fintech and the startup together. So at this learning hub, we can host hackathons. We can host... Uh, workshop together with the external players and come together and this is actually building something that us as a bank and our partners, um, startup and fintech, build a products together. Mm -hmm. And I think that working together has really helped mm -hmm. to bridge the gap, saying, you know, we have an innovation challenge, ACB Win 2018, and the teams are actually a combination of the internal people and the non-bank uh, external player. And what we see is the innovation has a much more balanced view from, from the external player, from, from the external player, they can bring in with us what the customer experience, what, what the pain point that they have, and then from the inside view, it's really it's the reality, how we can implement it fast, not some fancy, hey, you want this, but it's impossible to implement. So having that culture base there, it's really helped to bridge the gap and, and, and encouraging the collaboration from internal and external. Sure, okay, anything, anything you wanna add to that? No? I just referred back to the launch pad, right, and saying yeah. how, how you can do testing and doing beta testing is a great, great example of helping overcome the obstacles for collaboration. Sure, sure. Okay. So I think we're going to go back to, so we've got five minutes. We're going to go back to overrated, underrated. Uh, <laughs> chief innovation officers. Underrated, overrated. 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 Overrated, but there's a but. 
because you, you can't just rely on one person to innovate. Yeah. Yes, we, you have, let's say, for, 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 for us, we only have 11,000 people, but imagine if you can have 11,000 people be the chief innovation officer, it's going to spread like Wi-Fi. Ideas going to spread like Wi-Fi. It's just why limit it to one? Okay. I'm in favor of underrated. One person I agree cannot change it. But you have to implement it in organizations. And the more mature your organization, it's more you need for change in the culture. So for me, underrated. So you say underrated and too overrated here. Let's just see what the audience thinks. Chief innovation officers, underrated or overrated? So if you think overrated, put your hands up. Underrated? Don't know? Never heard of an innovation officer? OK. Um, AI. I a ah, cool. We have more questions. So the tablet's not working. So I'm just going to have to turn around and read. <laughs> ah, what, apart from your respective partners, what keeps you awake at night? <laughs> Attracting talents. Sorry? Attracting talents. Especially in, yeah, especially in our climates, it's, everything is changing so quickly. What type of work do you do in the evenings? <laughs> thinking, thinking of what's going to happen the next, next three months. Okay, fair. Usually when I get home, I'm so tired, I sleep quite well. Yeah. <laughs> Fantastic. I feel sorry for your partner. <laughs> I also sleep well, very well. Bitcoin. One statement. December 2017, 20,000 per Bitcoin US dollar. January 8,000, 60% loss in a short period of time. Statement number two, Sorry. one company, cryptocurrency had to declare bankruptcy in South Korea because two attacks to their systems and then we had to declare bankruptcy. High risk in cryptocurrency if it's not well managed. I'm not against cryptocurrency, but it has to be managed well. Okay. Um, another question. How do you reconcile between domestic, regional, and global needs of your organization? So there seems to be a sea change, certainly since the financial crisis. Global, regional, local. Where are you guys at with that? Yeah. So, uh, look, uh, I, I firmly believe that uh, customers' hopes, needs, aspirations are not very significantly different. Uh, and therefore, uh, you can think of product ideas that cut across uh, uh, geographical boundaries. Having said that, of course, there is uh, regulations and there's other things which can create differences. But generally, coming up with propositions, I think, can be done uh, on a multi-country basis. And if you can actually have a platform that caters to multi-country rollouts, that makes it a very effective uh, way of doing it. And I'm sure Deutsche would... Uh, must be doing a lot of work in that respect. It's interesting. As I European are saying, the Asians are much more advanced. Take China, the Beckers are taking WeChat, WePay. Uh, this is much more standardized. Um, and the revolution is in every market different. China, uh, very well positioned. India, totally behind, but Moody changed in so radical with a client identifier, with instant payment, uh, with all of a digitalization of a whole uh, payment and banking industry. And I see Europe very slowly moving in these directions. And by the way, US claims always to be so highly sophisticated, but it's still, check is a still most important payment form in the US. So okay. market by market difference, and we have to find solutions for the different markets. So I think we've got time for one more question. If you can bring one up. Let's have a look which we've got. I think we kind of covered that one. Uh, you guys okay to answer that question? So uh, at We've least the way I think about ten it. Seconds the way each. Sorry. 10 seconds each. Well, the way I explain it to the board is that this is all about sustainable revenue and sustainable returns. If you don't invest today for tomorrow's returns, your existing business model is going to have base erosion. So I just see this as, you know, essential thing to do to protect revenues for tomorrow. Okay. 
Well, I think it's, it's come from a, a wrong perspective. Like, like the title of this panel, it's, it's not versus. It's what if this lead to, innovation lead to future value, valuation or values, not revenue. So there you yeah. go. It's, it's a different thing, a different way of, of thinking about the investment. Okay. Well, Banks have to think differently. They have to be much more client-driven, client-user-friendly, systems, and open platforms. Okay, we're just going to finish up quickly. Overrated, underrated, AI. Underrated. Underrated. Uh, artificial intelligence, AI. Uh, AI. AI. Ooh. <laughs> underrated. Okay, uh, machine learning. Underrated. Underrated. Sorry, I couldn't understand. Uh, machine learning. Machine Overrated. Learning. Okay, last one, Brexit. Sorry. Brexit. Oh, underrated. <laughs> Overrated. Underrated. <laughs> underrated. Okay, I think we're bored of that now. So, fantastic. Thank you very much, guys. Thank you to all our CEOs in conversation.